Well, uh, I've been coming down to Savannah since I was a little boy. My mother, uh, her, her college roommate, was a Savannah girl. And so we were down here all the time. And uh, I love this town. I, I cannot tell you how overwhelmed we are to be received so warmly. Uh, this is really astonishing, Todd and Lisa, just, just amazing. And uh, I would, if I could, uh, thank a few folks. Um, and uh, this low country hospitality, Lisa, just amazing. You and your team have been over the top, uh, so professional, so helpful to us, and I cannot thank you enough. And, you know, Todd was talking about uh, putting us together. I, he, he's the matchmaker. Um, he really did get us together. I've known him for years. I trust him. Uh, you guys have one of the, the stellar team of uh, cultural excellence in this town uh, in Todd and as well as Lisa. And again, a hand for these folks. I, I can't believe. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. Uh, I, and I can't, I can't, it's, it's extraordinary that uh, this is the second time y'all have worked together and that's part of what we are trying to do in our mission is, is do this with all of the treasure of Georgia and we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, I, I would also like to say if Todd is the matchmaker, uh, Christopher Kay is the preacher who married all of us uh, and I'd, I'd really like to thank Christopher. I think Mimi, his mom, is here with us tonight. Uh, I'd also like to thank your team here, uh, Catherine Renner, Michelle uh, Riley, uh, Catherine Alt, Jessica Estes, Lisa Ocampo, who is handling the catalogs. These are some of the most superb catalogs of this exhibition. Y'all have to get, get one. Um, and uh, Todd, I'd also like to thank your folks, uh, Patty Meager, and Stan Deaton's in the room too, who I love seeing. He, he brought me over here with Patty the first time. Uh, I love that PBS series that y'all do. Uh, it's, it's, it's just great. Um, and also, uh, Bob Coffey, uh, he is helping us with the Georgia Public Broadcasting uh, special that we are going to be doing on three centuries of the Churchills in Georgia. Uh, as, as Lisa said, you are the eighth and final city. You are the finale, and we chose that intentionally. Uh, you have one of the most beautiful cities on this planet, and you are going to be the backdrop of each host city submitting some sort of cultural venue. For instance, the Columbus Symphony, the nation's second oldest, will perform at Bob's uh, venue with the city as the backdrop. So we're going to try to make three centuries of the Churchills in Georgia one of the most splendid PBS specials uh, ever produced in that network. Uh, I'd also like to uh, recognize, which I wasn't expecting, I sure am pleased, Rick Middleton, my fraternity brother from Washington and Lee. Nice of you to come, Rick. Uh, and uh, I think PJ Johnson is in the, uh, the back room, of an old colleague of mine from SCAD. PJ, wherever you are, thanks for coming. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is uh, uh, tell you about the Millennium Gate and um, also honey my wife Emily and my daughter Alexandra a SCAD student will y'all be easy on me at the end of the evening critique would you just be, be sweet to me. The Millennium Gate is the uh, museum that we have built in Midtown Atlanta in Atlantic Station. Uh, it's a uh, 10 story 100 foot tall triumphal arch based on the Arch of Titus in the Roman Forum. Uh, it has a Georgia History Museum underneath it, 12,000 square feet, uh, that highlights Georgia excellence and her connectivity to the world. And you can see in the picture on the lower right, as you come into the principal galleries, uh, they are very much focused on Savannah. They are the double parlors of the William J. designed Archibald Bullock House, which sadly no longer stands. Uh, we are very uh, inclined to represent Savannah in the Millennium Gate collection. We have numbers of things and refer to you even in our mission statement. Uh, we also have a period room, series of period rooms. The one in the upper left was uh, Lyman Halls from Midway, Georgia, one of the three signers of the Declaration of Independence from our state. Uh, the room in the upper right is the Rhodes Robinson Room, a 20th century period room designed by Philip Schutze of Columbus. Georgia, Edward Vason Jones from Albany, Georgia, and David Byers from Atlanta. 
It uh, is the same team of architects, particularly Edward Basin Jones, who did the State Department diplomatic reception rooms on top of the State Department in Washington. Uh, this so impressed First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy that she had them come initiate part of her restoration of the White House, which Mrs. Nixon really completed uh, later. And in essence, the period rooms of the nation where we entertain the world are done by Georgians, and the Rhodes-Robinson room is an, a, a, a very good example of it. Uh, we have a tendency to share what we do with the people of Georgia. And uh, 10 years or so ago, uh, we had two sculptures commissioned by Alexander Stoddart. He is Queen Elizabeth II's uh, sculptor, and uh, he was a little upset with me when I said, Sandy, we're going we're gonna to ship these things from your country to our uh, former colonial port. And we uh, are then going to put them on a carriage and drive them to Atlanta across the entire state. Uh, he had a fit. Uh, <laughs> but you can see how the backdrop of the city is so extraordinary. Um, <laughs> And this is one of the things I learned, which will help us with the public broadcasting special. There were about a thousand school children on the embankment, and they were mesmerized. Uh, and you can see the mayor here and Jack and uh, General James Oglethorpe. I think all of you know this guy. Uh, <laughs> a cool guy and it was really really a fun thing and so what we were doing and it's an old tradition that we have lost in this country and we need to embrace it again we could have flown these over everybody and landed them in our busy airport and trucked them over to the site and that wouldn't have included anybody uh, but we chose to share them with our people and they embraced it and we would uh, end up in town squares and the School band, marching bands would take us in, the mayor would drive it typically, and then a student would win a, the best poem or the best paper uh, and get to ride with the mayor. And so it was extraordinary. It took us a month and a half uh, to get from here to there. Uh, and I will say, uh, the good people of Rome, Georgia, uh, asked for us to come there and uh, they you know as we got farther and farther along they were hearing about it and I said hey guys you know not exactly on the way from Savannah to Atlanta <laughs> uh, but they promised us 3,000 students on the main street of Rome and so off we went um, they produced 5,000 and um, we were just in Rome uh, two cities ago and they received us not quite like this but they were very enthusiastic to have us back uh, you can see here uh, Governor Perdue, uh, my old dad, and Susan Eisenhower, one of our directors, bringing them home for the last time over the Great Yellow Bridge at Atlantic Station in Midtown. Uh, Henrietta Spencer Churchill is, uh, Lady Henrietta, is the daughter of the 11th Duke of Marlborough. And uh, Sonny Marlborough is here in the picture with my family at our house in Atlanta. And Henrietta has been a friend of ours for decades and is one of the more notable designers in the world today, uh, author of numerous books, and she did the period rooms for us at the Millennium Gate. Uh, as you see here, <laughs> Henrietta and her hard hat in the Rose Robinson room. Uh, she told me uh, to look up her cousin, Duncan Sands, and uh, that he had married a, a Macon girl and that I needed to take care of him. Uh, as a result, uh, as you will see shortly, Duncan is now taking very good care of me. Uh, this, as I was telling you, it goes back 300 years. Uh, these two great men uh, actually knew each other. Uh, John Churchill created first Duke of Marlborough, and you just saw the image of Henrietta's father, the 11th Duke. Uh, he was created Duke of Marlborough, having saved England from King Louis XIV at the Battle of Blenheim. He was created Marlborough and gifted this uh, royal property that the, uh, the monarch then built this uh, magnificent place called Blenheim Palace for him. The family are still there. And he trained James Oglethorpe in military tactics. Uh, Oglethorpe's brother was aide-de-camp to Marlborough uh, and James Oglethorpe was created the aide-de-camp to Prince Eugene of Savoy. So he was there, and as you all know, uh, we were created primarily for a military purpose, 
to protect Carolina from the Spanish royal governor in Augustine. Uh, and so if you look at it historically as we do at the Millennium Gate, you can arguably say that we owe our success to the Churchill family. You can see here uh, Churchill, Sir Winston Churchill uh, carried on the tradition subsequent generations uh, have an affinity for our state. And Sir Winston was born at Blenheim, and he is also buried there. You can see this simple grave in the lower uh, right of the picture at the Bladen Church. Uh, the monarch offered uh, a magnificent place for him at Westminster Abbey. Uh, he declined it. Uh, she offered St. Paul's. He declined that. He wanted to go home. He revered this place. He painted it often, and uh, he also proposed marriage there. And uh, he wanted to be known as the, the, the great commoner. You see here, one of the things that Duncan and I started to figure out as we moved about the state, and I was doing what Henrietta asked me. I was introducing him to friends and taking him around. Mimi had us to her house. Uh, the Callaways had us to their place at Hills and Dales in LaGrange. And we're having some cigars. And uh, Rick, you got any cigars, by the way? OK. <laughs> Uh, and some drinks at, at their place, uh, and they, we were talking about the exhibition and bringing it to the state and wanting to share it with, with uh, certainly uh, Atlanta folks, and they said, did you know one of our ancestors taught the prime minister how to shoot a Tommy gun? Well, we laughed him out of the room, and back he came with this image. Uh, and you can see uh, Mart, who is the strapping fellow on the left, he's the one who taught the prime minister how to shoot this thing, um, you can see Eisenhower in the distance also being trained to do this. Um, and sadly, uh, he, he, Mark died at D-Day. Uh, he, um, he had a son, and, and so the line continues. His, his grandson has actually been very helpful in advising us. Uh, Duncan set us up in the Imperial War Museum. You can see here the, the uh, cabinet war rooms on the right in the, the bunker where the prime minister would run the government when the Luftwaffe was dropping bombs on him. And this picture is prominently on display there. They know this story and this Georgia connection. And so Duncan and I then started to think, why don't we take this around the state and see if we can research a bit more to find out just how connected he was to us. Uh, there were s subsequent marriages and uh, all kinds of things that Duncan will tell you about. But I would like to start with his marriage, also at Sea Island, uh, to Mary Brown, brewer of Macon. Uh, Duncan and I got together, as, as Lisa and Todd have told you, to see how we could bring this collection to our people, to the people of Georgia. Uh, we are Duncan's adopted home, and he, he loves us. And it is an incredibly generous gesture that he has allowed us to take all these paintings off his family's walls all over the world, primarily in Britain, but all over the world. And as a result, uh, he, he said to me, I'm sure you would like to tour this thing, but if, if, if you don't mind, why don't we exclusively have it in Georgia? And let's just have it tour several cities in our state they're going to have to come see this and pay our airport fees, our hotels, <laughs> our restaurants, and really do it in-house uh, for our own people. And I can say that is one of the most generous, genuine, kind gestures I have ever experienced. And I would hope that you would give a rousing round of applause for Duncan Sands. Well, thank you. We, we have, as Rodney said, we have been uh, all around the state, and I have to say that uh, having uh, walked out of the exhibit on the top floor and seen that tonight we have an overflow, overflow area, uh, that's uh, pretty amazing. We haven't had uh, crowds as, uh, as big as this uh, at any of the other cities that we've been in. So thank you very much for, uh, for turning out in all the numbers um, that you have um, this evening. Now, I want to move on from this photograph because it's embarrassing to have it up there for so long. Um, but the connection actually, and I should just say that it's great to be here uh, in Savannah. Uh, some people have been asking me if I uh, have uh, been here before. I've been to the city on probably a, more than a dozen occasions 
um, and had a great time every time. So thank you for the warm uh, welcome that we have had. Um, but the connection uh, goes on um, with, uh, between the Churchill family and this state. Uh, in, uh, during the war in uh, 1943, uh, this is Mary, who's the youngest uh, of Winston and Clementine's children, who died last year, aged 91. She, at the behest of uh, George Marshall, went in Washington with her parents in September of 1943, uh, was asked to come to Fort Oglethorpe in the northwest of the state in order to meet uh, and some of the uh, ladies of the Women's Army Corps, the WACs, who were in training there. Uh, Mary herself was in the uh, Auxiliary Territorial Service, the ATS, uh, where she was famously visited by her father when she was in charge of um, a, an anti-aircraft battery in Hyde Park, um, and very embarrassed she was um, by that. But you can see her in these photos. Um, after the war, Sarah, her younger sister, who was an actress, uh, he used to drive her father up the wall in the 1930s with her music and dancing at Chartwell while he was trying to write books and speeches. Um, she uh, came to Atlanta in 1949 on a traveling tour for the Philadelphia story. Uh, she performed at the Penthouse Theater in the old, uh, top of the old Ansley Hotel, which became the Dinkler Plaza, and then uh, in sort of... Uh, I suppose in opposition to Rodney's, what he's trying to achieve in his life uh, of uh, preserving things, it was uh, demolished like many buildings in Atlanta. But you can see her in the top right-hand corner with, uh, with Margaret Truman. Well, she was here, she'd been sort of on and off with this man, Anthony Beecham. She hadn't uh, worked out whether she was going to get married to him or not, but uh, uh, she had five days at the end of the uh, tour in Atlanta, and so they traveled to Sea Island. Um, and there she decided that she would get married. Well, the one thing that happened there that um, perhaps when I went to go and see my, and introduce my wife to my great aunt Mary and told her that we were getting married at Sea Island, she suggested that perhaps I should um, read uh, her book on her mother to read about what happened with Sarah's wedding. So Sarah decides at this last moment to get married. She cabled her parents uh, to tell them. Um, but as uh, lots of people know, with technology uh, today, it doesn't always work. Uh, it didn't work, and uh, she, uh, well, it didn't arrive, and her parents, her father specifically, found out that she had got married from reading it in the newspapers. <laughs> Mary went on to tell me that, uh, the, uh, that it was some months, it was about four months before Anthony and Sarah arrived back in England and were actually introduced and she said that it was a very difficult moment. And in the <laughs> understatement of uh, the century, she said that matters had festered. <laughs> but the original, uh, the original connection in the 20th century was when Winston Churchill came to uh, Georgia in 1932. He had lost all his money in the 1929 Wall Street crash. And uh, his son, Randolph, had done a very lucrative lecture tour in the US. And he decided that uh, this was the way to replenish the family coffers. And so here you see um, on the boat arriving uh, in New York, uh, Winston and Clementine with uh, their daughter, my grandmother, Diana. Uh, and this is December of 1931. So Churchill's got it all planned out. There's going to be 55 uh, lectures up and down the eastern seaboard and into the Midwest over a four-month period. And he uh, is going to replenish the family coffers. He arrives in New York, makes the first speech, and the following evening he went to go and see his friend Bernard Baruch. Well, unfortunately, he did what many people do when you're in a country where you drive on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> he looked the wrong way, and uh, he was struck down by a cab. He should have been uh, killed. Uh, with what the police report said with the car traveling at the speed that it was, but he survived with cuts and bruises and just being severely shaken. But consequently, the whole lecture tour was turned upside down. Uh, the 55 stops became 12, but he was determined that he was going to come to Atlanta. And I think the part of the reason for that was because he was uh, in the process of writing the history of the English-speaking peoples. In 1929, he'd visited Gettysburg to uh, view the battlefield, where he famously corrected the official guide and turned out to be right. Um, <laughs> but he was determined that he was going to come here. And we always think of Winston Churchill um, you know, as a man who was prescient. Um, and he described uh, Atlanta as the, as the um, how, how do I put it, as the uh, metropolis of the New South. <laughs> But this was in Prohibition, and he needed to have a 
he needed to have uh, alcohol. And because of his accident, he persuaded and cajoled this, uh, this uh, d doctor, who really was the hero of this uh, whole trip, to write this prescription. But the thing that I like the best, which you may or may not be able to see, uh, particularly in the overflow areas, is that somebody has written, keep on hand, uh, in pencil at the top. And clearly, this was the most important uh, document that he had uh, in, his, uh, uh, in his possession. So, you, you know, as I was saying, we think of Churchill as a prescient uh, uh, man. He described Atlanta in 1932 as the metropolis of the New South, which I think, uh, you know, most people wouldn't, uh, wouldn't necessarily have thought it would go that way back then. Um, so he arrives here with uh, my grandmother, Diana, February 1932. Uh, they're staying at the Biltmore Hotel, and he has um, his lecture at the old Wesley Memorial Chapel on the pathway of the English-speaking peoples. It was extremely well received. It had uh, several days of press uh, that followed it. Um, and the next day, and I should actually say that that evening, he had arrived from South Carolina uh, with uh, some bootleg moonshine. And <laughs> Mr. Bridges, his... Um, agent uh, was not a happy man. Mr. Bridges was already uh, not making as much money as he thought because of 55 stops being reduced to 12. And uh, the last thing he needed now was to have his speaker dead from poisonous moonshine. <laughs> and so he dispatched his son to uh, the Biltmore in order to get a sample of the said liquid. And at the dead of night, he took it to Georgia Tech to uh, meet a chemistry professor who tested it. The moonshine turned out to be good. Um, and when, uh, when Mr. Bridges' son arrived at the Biltmore, he found Churchill's valet in a state of panic. Um, and he said something like, thank God it's good, because Mr. Churchill couldn't wait. He has already imbibed. <laughs> so the next day, he invited uh, Marion Britton, who was the president of Georgia Tech, to come uh, for lunch. Uh, at the Biltmore, and they then traveled to Grant Field, where this photograph was taken, where they uh, addressed, uh, he addressed and uh, reviewed an ROTC parade that was uh, taking place. And that evening, on his last night in Atlanta, he dined uh, with the, the uh, Bridges family at their home on Penn Avenue in Atlanta, where he signed the visitor's book, uh, which you can see uh, upstairs. Now, um, Churchill, when he signed the visitor's book, as you will see, um, did it with a historical theme in mind. And um, what is interesting is that my grandmother, who was aged 22 and single, uh, she had something rather different in mind uh, when she told a journalist on her way out that basically she would like to have met more men, more attractive young men, and partied more. Um, and she, she also said that she wanted to come to one of these famed and traditional southern dances, but she never managed to do it because uh, later in 1932, uh, she got married, and she so enjoyed the experience that she did it again three years later to my <laughs> grandfather. But on to the reason really why we're here, which is the painting. Um, as you heard from Lisa, uh, Winston Churchill took up painting in 1915. Uh, this was a man who had had a meteoric rise as an author, a journalist, and a politician. Uh, he'd really, um, professionally, he'd really been, at, you know, nothing that he had done had gone wrong. And as First Lord of the Admiralty, which he'd been appointed to in 1911, he made two big decisions. The first was to convert the Royal Navy fleet from uh, coal to oil, and the second was right in the days before the First World War started, when he uh, ordered the fleet uh, back to port in Portsmouth and then sent them out of the dead, at night, of, the dead of, the dead of night into the North Sea, therefore enabling the protection of Britain. So here is a man who's riding high who thinks that everything he touches turns to gold. And what happened uh, next was that he decided that in order to break the stalemate on the Western Front, uh, the best thing to do would be to invade uh, Germany's ally, Turkey, at Gallipoli. He dreams up, uh, this, uh, he dreams up this, this scheme, um, and 100 years ago this week is when the invasion began. And tens of, it was a complete disaster. Tens of thousands of men were lost and he was scapegoated and kicked out of office. And he fell into this deep depression. And I think he fell into the depression for three reasons. I think the first was that he was angry and bitter towards his colleagues in London, whom he felt uh, had treated him extremely badly. I think also that he was grieving for the uh, tens of thousands of men who had died, who he, whom he felt responsible for, because he had saved this operation and its planning on several occasions. But the reason I think he fell into the deepest uh, part of the Depression was because he always thought that he was going to die young. 
And in an eerily similar sequence of events, his father had had a very uh, similar experience in 1886 when, as Chancellor of the Exchequer, he challenged the power of the Prime Minister and uh, sent him his resignation letter, only to find that the Prime Minister accepted it. And Lord Randolph Churchill uh, was not to hold office again, and he was dead within 10 years. And I think that Churchill felt that that was going to, to happen to him. So he took this house uh, in the, uh, just south of London uh, for the summer. He had, was living in London with his uh, brother's family. His brother was serving on the Western Front. And he, uh, one Sunday when they were there, his uh, sister-in-law was painting in watercolours in the garden. And he went, as he was walking around and brooding, because he was uh, a very difficult uh, uh, person to live with at the best of times, but particularly that summer, and he stood and he watched her for a couple of minutes. And she wondered whether this might be the escape. And so she asked him if he wanted to have a go. He said yes. And uh, then he suggested that oils would be easier. And 45 years later, he put down his brushes, having um, painted more than 500 paintings. But not only, was this, well, not only was painting literally responsible for pulling him out of his depression, uh, leading Ernst Gombrich to say that, uh, the art historian to say that painting may have helped save Western civilization. But this man, uh, but he, he found from painting that he learnt skills uh, that he was able to use in his uh, political and diplomatic life. He talked about having a heightened sense of awareness and the ability to conceptualize. He also practiced, I think, what uh, we now know as mindfulness. And I think that when you look uh, in 1940 and you see uh, how, he, how he was able, despite all the action that was going on around, all the, the different viewpoints that he was getting, the people who wanted to appease Hitler, the people who wanted to surrender, he was somehow able to focus. And I believe very strongly that painting, the skills of painting, contributed to helping him to focus uh, in that way. It also provided him with uh, a, a place of solace. It provided him with a place that he could go to to regain perspective when uh, difficulties arose. And I think that that gave him, it enhanced his courage, and I think it enabled him uh, to, to take uh, those transformational decisions that are risky, uh, that might fail because he always knew that he could go back to painting. And he's, he was to say that um, uh, you know, he couldn't have coped uh, without painting, that he couldn't have borne the strain. And I think that that's, he found that as, a, as the place to, to really sort of regroup um, and move forward and upwards. So his early, uh, his early paintings were in the, uh, really in the, in the United Kingdom. Um, he took his paint box with him everywhere. And if he found what he described as a paintacious scene, then uh, out everything would come and he would paint it. And in fact, he would paint uh, a number of scenes several times over, including uh, there's one painting that's upstairs um, of uh, a bridge near uh, Aix-en-Provence in France. Uh, he painted two of those in a single day. He was a very, very fast painter as well. So the two paintings that we have here, one in the top left-hand corner, and I should say that... Um, you know, he was very uh, self-deprecating about his, paint his, his paintings. He called them his daubs. And he, um, he was not very good at sort of, you know, naming them or anything like that. And so consequently, there's some where we, where we don't necessarily know exactly what the name is or where the name is wrong. And the one in the top left-hand corner uh, was left uh, by uh, Clementine Churchill to my father uh, as a bequest in her will. And it was described as the Bargello in Florence. Well, it was always the Bargello in Florence. We had it up in Atlanta as the Bargello in Florence um, until some people from Florence came to visit the exhibition. <laughs> and they told us that, no, this is not the Bargello. Uh, this is the Palazzo Vecchio, which is uh, next door to the uh, Bargello. And they sent us photographs to prove, uh, the, to prove their case. Um, the, uh, the one in the bottom right-hand corner is uh, near Breckles, which is in Norfolk in eastern England. And so if you look at your map of England, it's the bit on the right that bulges out, um, the sort of Churchillian stomach, maybe you might call it. <laughs> and um, uh, this was uh, the village in which Clementine's cousin lived, and they went there on a fairly regular basis, and Churchill painted there and was captivated by this lake, which he painted um, several times over. But in the, uh, the majority of his paintings, he painted, as I said, three, uh, more than 500, 300 
approximately in the 1930s. And he painted about half, about 250 of his output in the south of France. Friends sent him there to the south of France um, in the 1920s uh, on account of the vivid colors and the bright light. Um, and my, uh, you know, he painted all, all over there. And my um, supposition is that when in the 1930s someone suggested for the same reasons uh, that they had sent him to the south of France in the 20s that he should go to, uh, to Marrakesh, to Morocco. Uh, my, my feeling is that perhaps he was running out of people to stay with in, uh, in, in the south of France and that that's why he needed to go to Marrakesh. And so the painting that you see in the bottom right-hand corner, um, when Churchill was draw drawing up his will, uh, he decided that he would leave one painting to uh, each of his grandchildren. And this is the painting that he painted that he painted and left uh, in his will to my father, which you will see, uh, in fact, both of these you will see uh, upstairs uh, in, in real life. Um, and so, as I said, you know, he painted all of these paintings, but there was one painting that he painted uh, during the Second World War, and I'm going to leave uh, Rodney uh, to tell you the story because it has uh, not only a remarkable story about how it came to be painted, but a remarkable story in terms of the history uh, of Western civilization. The historical circumstances around uh, the narrative of this exhibition, we don't take them lightly, uh, did art save the Western world. And uh, we have the narrative because of circumstances around the images you're about to see. The uh, Casablanca conference was held uh, there because we could, for one. Uh, the Nazis were on the run and uh, the thought that we would go to that part of the world and get these two great men together uh, was a, a great symbol. And the 10 days of uh, discussion, uh, which did not include Joseph Stalin, uh, were fruitful, but the prime minister is, he is a painter. Uh, he's a, a deep soul, and he knows that uh, he needs to be the best friend of Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, as, as a Brit would say, he wanted to be his mate. If you're a mate in, in British uh, slang, uh, you'll die for that guy. And he knew that he needed to get into the heart and soul of Franklin Roosevelt in order for that to happen. The 10 days of talks got Roosevelt to a point of saying that D-Day would occur when, they, when, when it happened. Uh, Stalin pushing for it to be a year earlier. Uh, as Duncan said to you, uh, he had Gallipoli on his watch. He also had Dunkirk. Uh, he came into office as prime minister just before Dunkirk, uh, and that was a narrow escape that could have happened and completely ruined him. Uh, and, and start it all over again. So he is wary, and he also knows that Franklin Roosevelt is a consummate politician, not an artist, uh, who could weigh things, make a decision, but weigh things and change his mind. So subsequently he knew he had failed in Casablanca and said, uh, Mr. President, you can't go back to Washington. It's the first time a president of the United States has ever been flown out of this country. Um, you must come with me to Marrakesh to watch the sunset over the Atlas Mountains. Now, you can imagine Franklin Roosevelt thinks the Prime Minister of England has lost his mind. Uh, Winston, what's the matter with the sunset here? Uh, it's five hours over the desert. Uh, it's dangerous. Uh, we haven't done any reconnaissance. Uh, it, it's kind of crazy. I'm sure he didn't say that, but uh, the Prime Minister is steadfast. We must go. Uh, you have ex uh, exotic architecture. You've got snow-capped mountains coming, crashing down into the desert sand. You've got uh, an oasis town that has the winds blowing up the sand at the end of the day, creating the most spectacular sunset you've ever seen. You've got the smells, the exotic cooking at that time of day. Uh, you must go. 
it, I painted it before. I've been there before. I have a friend there who has a beautiful place. It's what we're fighting for. Come with me to Marrakesh. The Secret Service says, absolutely not, Mr. President. We are taking you back to Washington. Off they go to Marrakesh. <laughs> and it, it's, it's been written in some of the, the, the family archives of Duncan's um, that planes were flying overhead, checking on their progress, uh, soldiers coming out of the dunes for the same reasons. I mean, this grand gesture could have been a disaster. It could uh, just an errant bullet, much less a, a automobile malfunction. Uh, it could have been a disaster. You have a sick president in a wheelchair, uh, but off they go. They get the president up to the top of the tower. Uh, evidently, Sir Winston is, is racing up the steps, counting the steps very enthusiastically. I think Duncan has said like a, a, a young schoolboy. They get Franklin Roosevelt to the top of the tower, and it was said by those present that it was quite an interesting experience for him. The sun, as you see, is hitting the president full face. He is, those present said, having one of the most extraordinary spiritual experiences of his life. And you can see that the sun hitting him full face is not what is the uh, circumstance, the prime minister. He's in the shadows. He is not looking at the sun. He is looking at his new mate. He has created his best friend and in this gesture and in his face, you can see that he knows he has saved his nation in this grand gesture and probably ours too. And so I can tell you that in, in our, our view at the Millennium Gate, the National Monuments Foundation, we regard this as probably the most important moment of the 20th century. What happened here was extraordinary. And then that night, they, they go to uh, a villa and they have a great party and as Duncan has also shared with you, somehow they seem to be, if you're in a Churchill uh, entourage, you find alcohol somewhere, even in Muslim countries. <laughs> Had a big party, there was singing and solos and all sorts of things and the president was so moved uh, that they, they said their, their goodbyes, but he was so moved that the next morning he went to pay his respects and say goodbye to the prime minister, his new best friend, again. Uh, Churchill didn't sleep very much. He would work from bed. He's working in bed, uh, and he's very touched that President Roosevelt has come back to see him and uh, says, I've already delayed you a day. I'm going to take you to the airport. I'm not delaying you anymore. And off to the airport he goes, now the world's press in tow. They know they're there in his pajamas. <laughs> And uh, Duncan has said in family archives that he was very moved at the president's plane leaving and uh, uh, very distressed, make sure he's thinking and probably praying in his mind to get the president safely back to Washington. He goes back to the tower and he paints the scene where he had taken the president the, the day, the evening before. It's the only painting he did in World War II of the over 500 paintings that he did between 1915, 1916, and 1960 when he had a stroke. And um, hey, you guys, just hold for a second. And so um, as a result, uh, he gifts this painting to President Roosevelt. Uh, it goes to the White House, and it hangs in the White House for years. Uh, well, not that many. Uh, it hangs in the White House until the president dies sitting president in our state at Warm Springs. It then goes to Hyde Park and hangs there for about 10 years until Elliot Roosevelt sells the picture and uh, it goes to a New York collection. And it stays in the River House, uh, uh, where my wife grew up, uh, for a while until it then goes to uh, New Orleans Gallery and it goes dark and no one has known where it has been for years and years since that time. Our curator, Ann Duncan, said this picture is arguably the most important picture of the Churchill world, uh, and we would really like to try to find it. And said, how long will that take? Because as Todd and Lisa have told you, putting an exhibition together of this scale in the short period of time we did, is almost miraculous. And so they said, 
it might take us a month. And I said, you got two weeks. And so it was tracked to, uh, she, they tracked it as to what was going on in New Orleans at the time that it was last reported there. And uh, some sports events and a major motion picture was being filmed there. Uh, she comes back to me uh, with Duncan and says, uh, an actor who rented a house here and went to the set here would have to pass this gallery every day if he walked, which is a stretch. Uh, but uh, he is currently being advised, we found through a family member, uh, by the commandant at West Point, and he was doing a military movie, and I know that guy. Uh, can, we, can we approach him and see if he would ask if the guy owns the painting, because he's, nobody knows who owned it, and if he would loan it to the exhibition. Uh, I, I call that guy, I mean, it, it, it came back as, how in the world did you know any of this stuff? And uh, if the narrative, did art save the Western world, if that is the narrative of this exhibition, then yes, you can borrow this painting. Uh, when Duncan came and told me that news, it was like fireworks went off over the top of the Millennium Gate that day. Uh, the lost, we call it, I call it, the lost Roosevelt painting. And uh, subsequently to that, uh, if you can proceed subsequently to that, uh, we opened this exhibition in LaGrange uh, as a result of the Callaway gesture in that picture that I showed you of Mark training the uh, Prime Minister how, how to shoot a Tommy gun. Um, and uh, as a result of that, we opened this in LaGrange and uh, we got a call back. And before you turn it around. <laughs> We got a call back uh, from this actor who said, uh, it's been a while, you guys are doing things way out of the box, you've opened this world-class exhibition in a city I've never even heard of. And uh, I've changed my mind, you can, you can uh, he had already said we couldn't use his name, but he said, I've changed my mind, you can use my name, but I've had a change in my circumstances since we last talked, I've gotten married, I would like you to add my wife's name to the, the plaque under the painting, please add Angelina Jolie to the list. The painting was to come to Atlanta and stay in Atlanta and return to Los Angeles. Uh, we told them that Savannah had really responded to us in a way that was extraordinary and that the Georgia Historical Society and Telfair uh, was just absolutely on board and they sent it back to us and it is now here for you to see now.